Well, attention to all bargain shoppers. Each year, Warren Buffett, billionaire Warren Buffett, for a charity allows the charity to auction off one or two hours of his time, the lunch hour, in fact, to meet with the highest bidder, all of that, uh, those funds raised going to a charity. And he meets with this person, the winner of uh, the lunchtime meeting with him, and I don't know what they discuss, if he imparts to them financial wisdom or if he lets the person who has won the bidding pick the topic of discussion. But it was at an all-time low in recent years. This past year, if you had $2.68 million, you could have had lunch with Warren Buffett. Today, as we return for the second week in a row in our series in the Gospel of Mark to the specific private teachings that Jesus is giving to his disciples, his public teaching ministry pretty much through and now drawing down to the 12, as I think about Buffett, how much more this morning should we be on the edge of our seats how much more this morning should we have our ears wide open, our brains ready to collect all of the knowledge of Jesus as he imparts to us for the next, I guess, three hours, no, just 30 minutes, what he would have us know as disciples and followers of Christ. If I was going to have lunch today with Warren Buffett, I would be amped up. How much more should I be amped up? How much more? With God on earth telling me, who loves me, Mitch, this is what you need to know to live the life that I have planned for you. Amen, church? And so today we come with open ears, open hearts, ready to receive. On that note, let's go to our Father in prayer. Almighty God, um, some of us, Father, this is uh, not our first rodeo when it comes to sitting in pews and listening to a sermon. And Father, out of that, uh, there can be some, I guess, some rust sometimes, some, some rote and routine that gets built up. Father, would you knock that off today? Father, would you open our hearts? Father, would you have us prepare the soil of our mind to receive the seed of life from you? And Father, when we leave this place, may we be more in the plans and the promises that you have in store for us than when we came in. Father, it is in your son's name that we pray. Amen. So last week was our first week as Jesus is drawing down to just the 12 on imparting wisdom, lessons, and knowledge of how they should live. He's down to his last six months before the cross and so to the crowd, he teaches this. But to the 12, he drills down and like a laser beam, this is what it is to be a follower if you're going to come after me. And so last week's lesson, you remember, as he takes a kid, a small child, and places him there in their midst, and then taking that child in his arms saying, it's about humility. Yeah, I heard you on the road arguing about who's the greatest in my supposed earthly kingdom that's coming. You're missing the boat, guys. It's about being the last. It's about being a servant of all. It's about taking a child like this that has no real you know, ability to bless you and you being all about the business of blessing this child. And we see a method to Jesus's, if I can call it, method to his madness. He's got to teach on humility. He's got to get hearts ready before he gets to his lesson today. Where would you go right after humility? Well, here's where Jesus goes. He's now going to teach on sin. He's not going to leave it till later. He understands it's something that needs to be dealt with. But he's not going to teach on sin to people who are, well, I'm there in my own right. I'm self-righteous. I've made it on my own. I'm not that bad of a person. No, he's going to teach on humility first. And once you've got your heart ready to understand the need for a Savior and you have humbled yourself, now he's ready to teach in this method to his madness this lesson on sin. May we all today as we move forward in this lesson have the spirit of Romans 3 and 23. For all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Amen. If you've got your Bibles, please turn to the Gospel of Mark chapter 9 and verse 42. Just going through scripture, fresh off the heels 
of him teaching on humility, on teaching on being a servant to all and not seeking to be the greatest in the earth's terms, he now turns in Mark chapter 9 and verse 42 to this teaching on sin. And if anyone causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him to be thrown into the sea with a large millstone tied around his neck. If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life maimed than with two hands and to go to hell, where the fire never goes out. And if your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life crippled than to have two feet and be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to sin, well, you need to pluck it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into hell where, the wor where their worm never dies and the fire is not quenched. Everyone will be salted with fire. Salt is good, but if it loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? Have salt in yourselves and be at peace with each other. What we just read is maybe not just one of the most radical teachings of Jesus, not one of the most shocking teachings of Jesus, but maybe what we just read is the most radical, the most shocking, the most language filled in the strongest of terms teaching that Jesus has ever unleashed. I mean, it's unbelievable some of the things he's saying. This morning, if you've got your smartphone, you've got the sermon app, you can fill in on that or on the back of your handout, there's a sermon outline. Our first point today is this. From this reading, you can rightly come to the conclusion that Jesus considered sin to be serious. Jesus not only considered it, Jesus considers in the present tense sin to be serious. Why would he be so aggressive in his language? Why would he save his strongest terminology, his most radical phrasing for the subject of sin? Why would he be so aggressive with this teaching? Okay, here comes a deep truth this morning, church. Because we need it. <laughs> Did you get that? When Jesus goes strong to the whole, so to speak, when Jesus goes all out with a teaching, you can bet that he's not having a mood swing day. You can bet that his sugar level's not low and he's just kind of mad and here you go. This is the perfect teacher with the perfect lesson, with the perfect words, and at the perfect moment, he levels and brings forth the strongest teaching out of his repertoire and he brings forward this aggressive word because we need it. There are people today that talk about their walk with God. And I, I love this terminology. I, I, I talk like, you know, how is your walk with God? How is your spiritual walk with God? And then people will talk about, I fall into this, how's your prayer life? How's your reading the word life? How's your quiet time life? How's your devotional life? How's your meditation life and your walk with God? It's interesting to me that people, when they talk about their walk with God and their quiet time life, their Bible reading life, their prayer life, that we don't use the phrase, my sin removal life. There is no one that can have a walk with God that is not talking about prayer, that is not talking about devotional time, that is not talking about meditation time, but is also not talking about their sin removal life, where it is a priority that they consider the removal of sin to be serious because Jesus considered sin to be serious. It's been that way from the beginning. Genesis 4 and 7. When he's speaking with, when God himself is speaking with Cain, if you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must rule over it. Here's this terminology of responsibility. Sin's after you. You've got a responsibility to act accordingly once you understand this truth. 
In fact, you must rule over it. You have a responsibility to take sin seriously. It's not just an Old Testament concept. Colossians 3 and 5, responsibility again. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature. Here comes this list. Sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, greed, which is idolatry. You have a responsibility. Well, why why should I take this so seriously? Next verse, Colossians 3 and 6. Because of these things in this list, the wrath of God is coming. As the old Puritans used to say, be killing sin or sin will be killing you. Jesus in his teaching now that he's made the case in the terminology and phraseology that sin is serious lists two ways that we need to deal with sin. Number one, be radically concerned about others. Be radically concerned about others. Last week, we talked about the store we like to shop at in our old human nature, the Me Depot. We, we love this store. We love to be, it's just, it's just my go-to. I love default nature to be concerned about myself. But in dealing with sin and being a follower of Christ, I'm concerned about others. That's not what Jesus is teaching here. Jesus is not teaching about being concerned about others. His language is be radically. If Jesus was typing this out, it would be an all large font and a different color. Be radically concerned about others. Well, what are some ways that I can be radically concerned about others? So last week on humility, Jesus takes a little one and he says, you need to be humble. You need to greet this child as if you were greeting me. And when you greet me, when you greet this child, you're not only greeting me, you're greeting the one who sent me. So be humble. And sticking with this little one, Jesus ramps it up in Mark and in the Gospel of Matthew. Let's read together. Matthew 18 and 6. If anyone causes one of these little ones, notice this one. Those who believe in me, boom, he just blew it up. Well, it's easy to be concerned about three-year-olds, they're so cute. It's easy to be concerned about first graders, they're so cute. It's not what Jesus is saying here. If anyone causes one of these, oh yeah, new disciples, these little ones that are 30 and 50 and 27 and 18 and 15, and some new disciples that are 87, they've just heard about me. If anyone causes one of these little ones, those who believe in me, to stumble... It would be better for them to have a large millstone hung around their neck, dot, dot, dot. A radical way to be concerned about others in the life of this church and in this world that you live in is don't cause, in this instance, another follower to sin. Now, don't cause anyone to sin. But Jesus gives special emphasis to these little ones who believe in me. In church life. Don't do your thing because your thing is okay with you. Be a person who is concerned about doing your thing and the ramifications that that could have on others. Don't cause one of these new believers, these little ones who believe in me to fall. Though it may be okay what you're doing, if it causes them to stumble, then it's not okay. Paul would spend volumes on this in the New Testament. Now, let me say a warning real quick. As someone has still got this language of millstone around their neck and, you know, jumping in the lake today. Quick warning. This language is not intending for you to do yourself in. Right now, there's a council in the room going, thank you, Mitch, for throwing that out there. Because there is someone who is going to take this in concrete, literal, well, the Bible said it. It would be better if I were to throw myself into a lake than cause someone to stumble. And Mitch, you said in Romans 3 and 23, we're all sinners. So I guess I'll just, this language is not called for you to do yourself in. It is a challenge and a call for you to do sin in. This is not calling for you to stop you. It is calling for you to stop it. Luke 17 and 1, a freebie for you this morning says this. Things that cause people to sin are abound to come. But don't be the person. 
and woe to that person through whom they come. Don't do yourself in, do the sin in. Don't stop you today, stop it today. Jesus considers sin to be serious. And one of the ways that we deal with it is we are radically concerned about how others are progressing in the life of Christ. Amen, church? That's what family's all about. I'm not just concerned about me. I'm concerned about you and you for me. I've shared this before. My favorite song as a little kid growing up in the church. Being a little boy, I needed some violence, you know, in my church singing. Blue skies and rainbows, that was all good. But roll the gospel chariot. That was my favorite. Because Satan was in the way and we needed to run right over him. And man, me and my crew, we got after that. Y'all, some of y'all right now going, what church did you grow up at, all right? Anybody identifying with me a little bit on this? Okay, anybody roll that? Maybe I should have the elders come up right now. You'd go, and we would never forget that sermon, all right? <laughs> and man, on that roll the gospel chariot and you're five years old, you are rolling over Satan. Now the next verse, I got it, it's theologically correct, but it wasn't as much fun. When a sinner's in the way, we didn't roll right over them, did we? What did we do? We stop and pick them up. That is deep theology. That's Luke 15. Someone has blown it and comes home, I'm radically concerned for them. I stop what I'm doing. We're running late for church today. I got to get to my pew. I got to get to my class. I'm shopping at the Me Depot, even at the church. Hey, you're in my pew. Get out. All right, you know, and it's me. Stop it. Stop it. You mean there are even sinners in this room? Every last one of us is a sinner. We dealt with that already in Romans 3 and 23. So stop it and help pick them up. Ask them how their day is going and mean it. Set up the lunch. Send a note. Offer up the prayer. You mean these kids when they were five years old? Some of the deepest theology you ever got was when you were five years old. What would happen today if every member of this church sang that song in a minute? I will stop today and I will help pick sinners up. We couldn't build auditoriums fast enough in this place. We'd have morning services going into the evening. If every member said, I'm going to stop. And I'm going to help pick a sinner up today. And I'm going to mean it. Because Jesus considers sin to be serious. And he has called me in a radical way to care and be concerned for others. A group that I love, love every group at our church, but I mean our Celebrate Recovery. You let Christmas fall on a Friday. Let Thanksgiving, well, it never falls on a Friday, but let, let another holiday fall on a Friday. Let's stick with Christmas. You know where, you, what you'll find in our chapel? You'll find our CR team. Well, surely on Christmas they take off. Never do they take off. In 10 years of Celebrate Recovery, you have never been up here once on a Friday night. What about when there was eight inches of ice? You better come up here and check it out because they are there. They stop and they pick sinners up. And every Friday night, they invite people to come forward and get a blue chip. There'll be a, a woman down front, a sister and a brother in Christ, and they come down front and they don't sing an invitation song. I, no offense. I, I kind of like what they do better. They go nuts when people come forward and no one says a word. They just come forward and they say in their mind, I got to hurt I got a habit and I got a hang up and life could be better and I want things to be different and they get a blue chip and they get a hug and the room of 100 to 50 people just start, yes! Well, is that biblical? And when one comes back from being lost, the Lord sings an invitation song. And no, 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 it doesn't say that. It says they rejoice in heaven. They go nuts in heaven. They, I mean, they throw a party in heaven when one comes back. And you know what happens when they do that on Friday nights? The person who sits there goes, I think I can do that too. I think I can do that too. And because one had the courage to go forward and take sin seriously, someone else says, 
I'm going to step. And it is the most brave and daring thing they've ever done. And they walk forward too. And Jesus looks down and he goes, that's it. That's the crack and the wiggle room that I needed to begin to plant new life and new beginnings and a new chapter. Let us be people who are radically concerned about others. Number two, Jesus gives us another way to deal with sin. Be radically consecrated in your life. This language of cutting off, this language of plucking out, we understand it's hyperbole. We understand Jesus doesn't want us to do ourselves in, but do the sin in. But the imagery is so radical and strong. What is he saying in this in being radically consecrated, dedicated in your life? Jesus is saying, there is nothing too big, there is nothing too small to give up or forego for the call of living Christ in your life. Give it up. Be done with it. Well, Mitch, Mitch, I've got a problem here because in Mark 7, I really can't be done with it. I can't cut it off. I can't pluck it out. I can't cut off my foot because Mark 7 says that sin comes from the heart. Just just stop that. Just stop it. (laughs) We all know that what comes from the heart very quickly partners with something on the outside. And what Jesus is saying is, remove it. Stop it. And you notice the genius what Jesus does here? Hand, what you do. Feet, where you go. Eyes, what you see. Three things, he's covered it. Be careful where you go. Be careful what you do. Be careful what you see. Whatever is causing you to be less for God, stop it, remove it, cut it out and pluck it out. Well, what would that look like? Associations. If you have someone in your life where every time you're with them, you gossip. I'm not telling you to end that friendship, but I'm encouraging you to take a time out. Well, Mitch, that's not your right to do that. I hope it's not my right. I hope it's the Bible speaking to your heart. Cut out that relationship for a while. Because every time we're together, you say, I know where it's going to go. It starts off with how you're doing, small talk, small talk, and then we're in somebody's stuff. Cut that out. Take a break from that. Remove yourself from that. Be radically consecrated in your life. If you're in a dating relationship where it's sexually immoral, it's going places physically it should not go, it's gone. And and there's no time out from that one. That relationship is done. Remove it. It is strong language. One of the heroes in my life that is a member of this church is a brother who has, in the distant, distant past, had a trouble with his smartphone. Because your smartphone just won't connect you good with text, emails, and phone calls, but it'll connect you with the web. And it'll take you places you don't need to go. And so I have a hero in my life at this church that doesn't have a smartphone anymore. He says, I'd love to have it, but I had to cut it out. And so I got a flip phone, because I don't need that in my pocket. I don't need that temptation in my life. He took Jesus at his word and he cut it out. To our youth who struggle with this, to our older youth who struggle with this, I got a word for you this morning. You need to get this phone right here, okay? You need to go retro. Go ahead and bring up the picture of that phone. There it is. (laughs) To our youth group, you roll in school with this phone tomorrow, you'll be the coolest kid in school, all right? (laughs) They will be like, where did you get that? It's called the brick. Go with that. There'll be no temptations on the World Wide Web with that thing, okay? When people talk about this church, let them talk about that we are radically committed to missions, that we are radically in love with our children and our youth group, that we are radical about this and that. But never let them talk about the Park Plaza Church without them understanding that we are dedicated to the radical removal of sin. Why? Because our Lord has called for an all-out war on sin. He hates it. He knows it kills families. It destroys marriages. And it wrecks lives. And Jesus has called for a shock and awe campaign against sin. 
And since he has called for it, let the church rise up and be about it. Why does he do this? Number one, he understands you'll be miserable. There is nothing worse than a carnal Christian. Someone stuck in the middle. You're lukewarm. Be hot or cold, but don't be a carnal Christian. But the real reason in this scripture that we read today of why Jesus is serious about his war on sin is not because you'll be miserable in this life, because you'll go to hell in the next life. May I now quote the words of Jesus. Verse 43, you'll go into hell where the fire never goes out. Verse 45, you'll be thrown into hell. Verse 47, this doesn't sound much like the Jesus I know. This sounds exactly like the Jesus you know. It would be unloving to say anything other. Verse 47, thrown into hell where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. Back to the earlier point, our first point, this is why Jesus considers sin so serious. The mark of a believer is a hatred of sin and a healthy fear of what sin can do. Last verse, a little bit complex in understanding it. Now believing that these disciples and hopeful that these disciples would take such a strong teaching to heart and act upon it. Not be perfect, but move in that direction. He now comes to this last verse. Let's read together again in Mark 9 and 50. Everyone will be salted with fire. Do I think we've got Mark 9 and 50. Everyone will be salted with fire. So let me stop right there for the person who goes, great. <laughs> you know, he just said, you're going to go to hell if you sin. And there's fire there. Next phrase, everyone's going to be on fire. That's, he, he's changed metaphors on us. He's now talking about consecration. He's now talking about what people in that culture would have understood about out of his teaching thus far calls for a sacrifice. He's not talking about going to hell here, that everyone's going to be on fire. Everyone's going to be sprinkled or salted with the fires of hell. He's saying based upon his earlier teaching about taking sin seriously, it's going to call for a dedication, a consecration, and a sacrifice. And with that being the case... And being disciples who are humble and want to hear this word from a loving father, a loving savior, and go, yes, I want to act accordingly. In Leviticus, those who offer themselves good fire, sacrificial fire, is placed upon them. Everyone will be salted with fire. And he goes on, Salt, this salting is good. But if you lose this saltiness, if you lose the sacrificial spirit, how can it be made salty again? Therefore, have salt among yourselves. Stay a sacrifice. Keep your bodies on the altar. And in so doing, be at shalom, be at peace with each other. Because now you're concerned about each other. When you're consecrated in yourself and taking care of yourself, in the ways of Christ, that's the best thing I can do for you. Well, I really want to help out the youth group here, but I'm going to live any way I want to. That's, that's a farce. That's a travesty. They're going to see right through that. But if I have salt, and if I keep my body on the altar, if I continue to offer myself up, not perfectly, but Jesus, I'm, I'm, I'm hearing you, and I'm trying. Now we begin to live at peace with one another. Now they begin to see something and not just hear something from their preacher. Our lives become, as Paul would say in Romans 12 and 1, a living sacrifice. Great preacher once said this though. The problem with a living sacrifice is this. It keeps trying to crawl off the altar. Can you identify? I can. I give myself to you, Jesus. And why do I have to keep doing that every day and sometimes every day? every five minutes because the old man keeps wanting to get off. Church, holiness matters. Purity matters. Righteousness matters in yourself and in others. Join Jesus today in this all-out attack on sin. Remove anything 
and everything and throw off everything that so easily hinders. I'm going to ask for David and Tina Henley to come forward. We're going to do our invitation a little bit different this morning. If you want the prayers of the church, if you want to offer your life in baptism to Christ, if you want to be a part of this family of believers, that invitation is always open to you. David and Tina have served in our Celebrate Recovery for the past decade. And as was the case with CR, always a sister and always a brother, as we stand and sing in a moment, I've asked for them to stand. And if you don't want to say a word, but you want to come forward and say, I want to be radical about the removal of something in my life. Just get a blue chip, you put it on your keychain, and the rest of this week, maybe the rest of your life, you reach down and you go, radically concerned about others, radically consecrated in myself, because Jesus considers purity of the utmost importance. Today, if you want to get a blue chip, today, if we can pray for you in any way, will you come now as we stand and as we sing?